Welcome to Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust's virtual conference, Sharing Our Seas, Seals and People. We are excited to share an inspirational series of talks, exploring a variety of aspects of seal conservation in the UK. And it's our 20th birthday. In that time, we've done 35,000 plus surveys, processed over a million photos for 72,000 plus seal IDs. To make sure we can continue this important work, Check out our website to join our Wild Seal Supporter Scheme, back our crowdfunding campaign or shop in our online store. Thank you for your support. Uh, hi there everyone, thank you so much for joining us today at the Cornwall Seal Research Trust Sharing Our Seas Virtual Conference. My name is Gem Simmons from the North Wales Seal Research Organisation. This talk is actually on behalf of myself and Amanda James from the North Wales Seal Group. Uh, we are unable to do this talk together um, due to COVID regulations, unfortunately, so you are stuck with little old me. Um, today we are going to be telling you um, about North Wales Seal research. So I thought it would be quite nice for you to meet the team. This is probably the only time you'll see us. We do stay behind the scenes. Um, but there are currently two volunteer groups in operation uh, in North Wales. So first up we've got the North Wales Seal Group which was founded by Amanda and has been uh, going for quite some time, quite a few years, uh, collecting quite a lot of data. And then we have the North Wales Seal Research Organisation which is currently in the process of being a little bit more public so we're just in the process of getting ourselves off the ground but the research that we undertake has probably been going on for about six years. Uh, so we're currently deciding which way our research is going to go, which sort of direction we're going to head in. Due to time constraints, unfortunately, I do not have time to introduce um, every single beautiful individual on this page. Um, but we do appreciate every single one of them very, very much. I just want to give a special mention to Aj and Ashley, first of all, uh, because their photographs feature quite heavily throughout this presentation. And we are so, so grateful for them. Um, their photos are actually featured quite heavily throughout of a lot of my research. Uh, and I just want to say a really big thank you um, for that. I use it in every aspect of my research because the, the photos are just beautiful, second to none. So thank you, um, Ashley and Anch. Um, so we both get up to lots of different kinds of research um, and engagement as well. So North Wales Seal Group has a big focus around the Orm area, which is where a lot of their data comes from. But they also do engage with stakeholders outside of that area. Uh, they are by no means confined to um, the area. So that's marked as Area 3 um, on this map. North Wales Seal Research Organisation aims to collect data outside of that area uh, because they've kind of got it under control. Um, and hopes to get some sort of long-term monitoring in place that hopefully uh, we can expand along the coast. So collectively, we intend to update monitoring protocols um, along the entire coast. And we have highlighted quite a few areas of interest uh, in the past year or so. So you will probably notice that I am being deliberately vague in regards to uh, locations. That is, unfortunately... The nature of pinniped research in North Wales and I'm sure in many other places across the UK at the moment as well. Mainly because we have quite open accessible beaches that means seals are very susceptible to disturbance. So we don't mention specific locations on social media or online. We only publish them really in scientific reports where needed. Um, so what we tend to do is we break up the coast into areas or zones. And then we refer to them by that because that's quite a, a large, broad area. So it's not going to give anybody a specific location um, or bring any threat with it. The past year of research has actually, I would say, highlighted areas two, three and four, which are the real flats, the Orm area, and then uh, the flatter beaches around Penmai Mauer as uh, what I would call a red zone for disturbance. We've had a lot of disturbance cases along these three areas in the past year. Uh, so it's not static. We are malleable. Um, as research on goes, we will probably break this down further into um, smaller areas because, as you can see, around Anglesey in particular, they are very, very large areas. So we need to see where we're at with seals along the coast. Uh, but that's what we're kind of here to do. We're kind of here to understand what's going on and um, who's going where, that sort of thing. 
Uh, so on to the main talk, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of common seal research in North Wales. Uh, definitely my area of interest. Um, I'm a big fan of common seals, even though I do love the grey seals as well. But something very interesting is happening with common seals along our coast. They are slightly different to those beautiful grey seals, which we're all used to. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of an overview, one of the first things that I tell people in regards to the difference between the two species um, is one looks like a dog and one looks like a cat. So grey seals, very large dog-like faces. They have what we call a Roman nose. Um, so if you look at the so side profile, uh, their forehead basically slopes right down to the nose. So they have a big Roman nose, really large, fat heads. Uh, common seals, which are also known as harbour seals, you will notice that I do sort of interchange between the two. I normally call them harbour seals. I'll explain why they're called common seals as well in a second. But they've got much uh, rounder, cuter, cat-like faces uh, and a snub nose. And they do have a sort of forehead uh, in comparison to the grey seals anyway. Both species are sexually dimorphic, so males are bigger than the females. That is particularly evident um, in the grey seals. Common seals are slightly smaller than grey seals. I say slightly smaller, they're quite a bit smaller um, when they're um, fully grown. Uh, big difference between them anyway. I think it's a very obvious difference. Grey seals are more vocal. I would agree with that statement. Some people might not, but... Generally, when I walk the coast um, looking for grey seals, I hear them a lot longer before I see them. Uh, whereas I very, very rarely hear harbour or common seals. Um, it's normally only when I'm rescuing them and when I've got really close and I'm really annoying them that they tend to make any sort of noise at me. And even then it's sort of a chuff noise, whereas the grey seals um, do this really beautiful singing um, or barking. Pretty much whatever they're doing, they are quite a noisy animal. And then another thing to look out for is their nostrils. So grey seals have parallel nostrils, whereas harbour seals, their nostrils are more V-shaped. Uh, so again, if you look at that image at the top, you can see the difference between them. Now, they were called common seals because back in the day they were quite common. Pre-distemper, so pre-1988-ish, uh, some research suggests that common seal populations were actually double that of the grey seal population. So um, that's quite interesting. Uh, but December did wipe out a lot of them. I did find one fact, so I haven't confirmed if it's true, but apparently um, around Europe during December, 18,000 seals died and only 300 of those were greys. The rest were all common seals. Um, so that's quite interesting. But certainly in North Wales, they are absolutely not what I would call a common animal. I think a lot of people would agree with that statement. Um, which is why we tend to call them more harbour seals than anything else um, these days. So this is just some of the sightings, including uh, one just a few weeks ago. So huge thanks to Angela for that. Um, she sent us a sighting in Puffelli Harbour. Uh, thank you very much, Angela. We really, really appreciate it. As I told you um, on your message, um, it makes a huge difference to our research. So thank you very, very, very much. She sent us some really lovely photos too. They were actually really hard to fit on the page, which is really exciting for me. So this is not by all means all of our sightings. These are just sort of the main ones and the rescues as well. Um, so you can see um, 2017-18, uh, one or two sightings a year. Then 2019 last year was just huge for common civil sightings and rescues. And then it looks like 2020 is on track to be just as busy yeah i think we're probably seeing a little bit less just because of the lockdown more than anything now we're not saying that they are increasing that would need some studying but it could just be down to we are observing more uh, but it's definitely interesting it's something that we are paying attention to so here are some photos of the regulars and um, they do seem to flock towards Adge in particular. He's some sort of magical seal whisperer um, and he's even managed to get some shots of them mingling in the local grey seal call out sites. So um, you'll see on some of these picture pictures I find them really hilarious. Loads of huge grey seals and then just in the background there'll be a little common seal um, trying to look inconspicuous. Uh, the grey seals luckily don't seem too bothered by them, so it's nice to see how they're interacting and getting on. 
At the top in the middle, you've got one of my favourites, One-Eyed Willy is what I've named him. He doesn't have one eye, he does have both eyes, but his right eye is quite um, has a quite a bit of scar tissue in it. I would assume he is blind or can see very little out of that eye, uh, but that would need a medical professional to decide on that. In the corner, we've got Little Roo. Little Roo was a rescue last year. Unfortunately, she did pass away. Strangely enough, um, huge injury to the same eye as Willie. Uh, her right eye and it was um, she had massive infection in it and she just um, unfortunately she didn't survive. Uh, there are two in particular that we see a lot uh, more than any of the other common seals though so I thought I would introduce you to those separately. So first up we've got Penryn I think he's definitely a favourite of the North Wales seal group and he's often spotted very often actually for about one to two years so far. Uh, we have had one call out for him um, British Divers and Marine Life Rescue were called out in March. He seemed to have some sort of minor respiratory infection. We hope it was minor. There was no place for him in a rescue centre and he seemed very feisty and very fit and healthy. So we actually left him to it. We think we've sighted him since. So fingers crossed he is um, absolutely fine. We don't think it was lungworm. But uh, Penryn does tend to hang um, between zones two and three on that previous map. Uh, and as I said, Adge seems to bump into him quite a lot uh, when Adge is out uh, taking photos and I think Ashley sighted him a few times as well. Uh, now, definitely my favourite is the very lovely Topaz. It's called Topaz um, because he was observed, I say being a nuisance, he wasn't being a nuisance at all. He was in his natural environment, but he was coming quite close to humans. So the RSPCA spray painted his side blue, which is where he gets the name Topaz from. He's basically a pain in the bottom ever since. So he was rescued in October because he decided uh, to come and sit in the middle of a road. He had an injury on his um, rear flippers so we decided to take him into a rescue centre. He was tagged and released from there after a few weeks and we've actually had five call outs to him since. Uh, but he's not against the idea of coming up and sitting on the prom. He does just tend to stare at people and wonder what they're doing and why they're so shocked. Um, sitting in roads, up on pavements, right next to um, public benches on the prom. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to a very special seal. Um, so this is the very, very beautiful Ariel. She definitely pulled at my heartstrings. She was observed originally in Prestatin um, at the start of March. We are not entirely sure uh, what happened here, but from what the locals tell us, she was put back into the sea without being assessed. Rescuers were actually never called and the locals called us to let us know. By the time we got there, she was already gone. So we decided it would be best to monitor the area because she didn't look very well from photos at all. Uh, and sure enough, we were called to rescue her just over three weeks later. Unfortunately, she did pass away in a rescue centre um, due to a heavy lungworm burden. But as you can see from the photo, she's got a little hat, which is actually a live tracker. We followed this up and we discovered that she was a rehab and release seal from Northern Ireland and was released with her pal Merida in November 2019. She was tagged as part of the Sea Monitor project, which is a collaborative project that aims to track and protect uh, vulnerable marine species using the latest technology. So Dr. Mark Jessup and Samantha Cox from UCC are in charge of Ariel's data analysis and they've been kind enough to share this with us. Uh, so this map shows the uh, basic information that's sent remotely, but by retrieving the tag after her death, um, we can actually analyse the fine scale data collected during um, Ariel's travels. I apologise for the amount of data I'm about to throw at you. Uh, Samantha and Mark have both um, done such a wonderful job at analysing all of this fine scale data that I wanted to include as much as I can. Uh, so apologies, but it's very, very interesting, I promise. Firstly, the colourful map shows Ariel's movements for the entire deployment, uh, so as soon as she left that beach where she was rehabbed. Uh, and this gives fantastic insight into what she got up to. You can see that after release, she actually headed north and moved up and down the Scottish coast for around about three weeks. I think it was just under three weeks, um, but didn't really stay in any particular place for too long. And then she almost made a beeline across the Irish Sea to North Wales, uh, with a journey time of just under one week and she seemed to like the area which we call the real flats and this is a very flat and sandy area um, but 
also includes an offshore wind farm known as Gwintermore Wind Farm, which I believe is the fifth largest operating offshore wind farm in the world. It's got over 160 wind turbines. Uh, so that grayscale graph, the long one across the top, is her dive behaviour over time, which does indicate that she dove to less depths um, in the time just before her rescue. I should mention that these tags are designed to fall off uh, when she molts. So they have a limited deployment. They will not stay on for life. They don't actually cause any harm to the animals at all. Uh, lots and lots of research going into them to make sure they are safe um, for use. But the data is so, so valuable. Unfortunately, as I said, she did pass away before she molted, so before the tag fell off, but that tag was retrieved um, and sent to UCC for this analysis. While at the Real Flats, it seems that she took repeated foraging trips out to the wind farms, which is illustrated um, in these graphics. Each one represents a four day period and the movements are coloured by time. So it gradually turns from yellow to green to blue, then purple as time goes on, if that makes sense. Um, so all of these are four day periods um, of her movements around that wind farm area. And then if you smoosh it all together, her entire time on the Real Flats looks like this. So she was a little adventurer. She did have a little look around the coast, um, but she definitely had a huge interest in those wind farms. Uh, so absolutely fascinating. Gets me really excited, this data. Um, I think it's wonderful. Uh, it gives us great insight into the life of a rehab seal, firstly. Um, but it lets us know what they get up to, where they travel to, how they learn to forage, how they dive. Uh, so as I said before, just completely invaluable to to research um, in pinnipeds uh, just like this. So going forwards with the research we hope to continue with what we are doing at the Orm area uh, by updating protocols and eventually expanding this um, along the entire coast to get more robust long-term monitoring data. We are very interested in disturbance issues in particular which we're currently working on um, but we also feel that there is a little bit of a disconnect between nature and people around the coast. You can't help but feel it. Um, a lot of people constantly tell us how they had no idea there were seals off our coast um, or even dolphins as well. Um, so we're keen to educate and engage with the public and stakeholders, uh, which we hope will ultimately lead to better protections um, and understanding of seals along our coast and then the marine environment as a whole. So I do quickly have a few thanks to go through. I am a little bit over my time. Uh, firstly, thank you as ever to all members of the North Wales Seal Group and the North Wales Seal Research Organisation, uh, who are all volunteers uh, and we absolutely love you for everything that you do. So thank you for that. Huge thanks to Dr Mark Chessop and Samantha Cox of UCC and the Sea Monitor Project and its funders. The data is fantastic. Thank you so, so much for sharing it with us. Uh, we hope we've done it justice uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, everything that you have to report back to us. Of course, thank you to British Divers Marine Life Rescue and the RSPCA. Um, special thanks to Cornwall Seal Group Research Trust for having us and allowing us to be part of this conference. And finally, of course, thank you to everyone for listening to us today. Uh, do stay safe. Thank you very much for having us. Bye. Thank you.